Hey, is that, how's it going? Hey, Claire, I'm good. How are you? Very well, very well. And so what time is it with you at the moment? Uh, it's going to be 5.20 a.m. here. I live oh. in the It's horribly early. <laughs> um, it's still dark. Yes. You know, the problem with being ready for this for half an hour before for the check-in and you know then you need to have got up and whatever so your alarm clock had a four in front of it probably today yeah I had to be up hopefully well I can be a little early to catch up on sleep <laughs> fantastic to have you thank you how is it what time is it for you um, so I'm in the UK and it's uh, 25 to 1 in the afternoon. So uh, it's not, just up to lunchtime, nice. effectively. Okay, not nice. Which means we've only got another like two getting dark again because it's uh, midwinter. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think I just saw uh, Tony joining. Oh, good. And there's some other people joining us from the session because uh, um, there have been uh, four other tracks uh running at the same time as this. So um, I'm expecting that people will be uh, mm -hmm. um, jumping out of those tracks, um, finishing up to uh, to join us, because this is the best place to be. <laughs> I, I hope you know, we have more people joining us, looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure we will.
And so what have you been working on uh, recently that's been keeping you um, focused? And... Uh, it's It's been pretty busy now that we are wrapping up, working on some of some some cool new features on our product. Mm. Which fortunately, I may not be able to disclose because we haven't released it yet. But um, something to do with testing, automated testing, uh, and some of the other things that um, you know, uh, a lot of our clients are looking forward to from 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 our product. So uh, exciting line of um, uh, releases. Uh, I mean, feature releases that's going to happen in the next mm -hmm. few months. So we've been planning and working on that. So that's that's been what keeping us busy. And, you know, talking to a lot of customers, a lot of people like in, in, in the conference, mm -hmm. like, I know we've met a couple of, this is the second time we're meeting like through API days. Um, so that's, that's also been a good uh, promoting platform for us in terms of what we're doing. So, that's, that's also keeping us, um, you know, looking forward to these sessions where we talk to people, where we see a lot of um, questions coming our way, making us think, oh, should we be doing it this way? You know, should we should be doing mm -hmm. it that way. Uh, it's a really good um, point, actually, and uh, um, a great, you know, important one for the audience to, to think about that, yeah, for organizations and teams, teams yeah. like, uh, like this. Um, yeah. These avenues are so important to get feedback. Welcome, Tony. You're, you're here. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> safely made it yeah yeah and i can hear and i can see and yeah and it can be seen so that's <laughs> all of that looking oh, great yes, <laughs> um uh we might just give it another couple of minutes to see if um anybody's gonna uh um sometimes people need to kind of rush and get you know do more than click a tab um they might be just uh, getting getting a cup of coffee or um uh, it's kind of lunchtime in Europe here at the moment, which is where most of our um, attendees are. So maybe people are just grabbing a sandwich um, between uh, between sessions, whatever time zone we're in. You're in the morning. Sweater's in the um, early morning. Uh, uh, earlier morning. Really, really early morning. Yeah, and I and I just had my sandwich, so I'm now excellent. Yes, excellent. I'm, I've been coffeeed up this morning, so uh, um, but yes, this is this is a good time for me. Yeah. Um, so um, we, we'll kick off and uh, uh, um, look forward to people joining us as we go. Um, my name uh, is Claire Barrett at API's First Consulting. Um, I'm delighted to have the uh, privilege of host of uh, emceeing this activity, this roundtable, that is brought to you by IBM as well, IBM is one of API Days' gold sponsors, uh, and. It's through there's an other sponsorship that actually these uh, events can be available to uh, not just this, this year, people in Paris, but uh, um, people all over the world joining us virtually and having had a look through where some of our um, attendees are from. Uh, it's every continent in the world um, every, uh, and countries all over the place, which is just fantastic. Uh, and of course, a global player like IBM, you kind of understand, get that as part of your DNA. Really uh, great. Well, you know, I'll say, Claire, it, we've been yeah. very delighted to just uh, be engaging through the virtual model, you know, this year. Yeah. Uh, you know, these API Today's events have been very important to us for a couple of years to be able to just be in the community and, and, and being able to listen, you know, and, and also share about, you know, what we're seeing in other customers. And so, uh, you know, it, just the whole org has done a wonderful job of making sure that we can continue to just make, uh, you know, API days uh, a continuing value point for both, you know, our customers, our partners and ourselves. Yeah, and so I was just saying as, um, as you were joining us that uh, uh, these, these sessions are a really important feedback um, loop for you into, into your teams as well to hear what, what questions are coming from the community. So, um, Great, and uh, let me introduce you um, uh, quickly. So Sweta uh, Sudaran uh, is a product product manager at IBM uh, in the States, and Tony Casio, director of the API management and gateway cloud integration team, um, joining us also from uh, North Carolina. So Sweta is over in the West Coast in San Fran, and uh, fantastic to have you uh, here this afternoon morning for you. Um, for anybody uh, online. Uh, the we'll take any questions um, from the online chat. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, keeping an eye on those. Um, and we're actually going to invite t t Tony, uh, you and Sveta to, to share, a couple, I think, a couple of slides that you'd like to um, introduce some context for this, this session. 
um, which is all about solving challenges in API testing for Agile. Yeah, um, you know, we thought it might be useful to have a picture in front sometimes uh, the, uh, you know, just having something for everyone to look at and, and comment to. And, and so, you know, we thought about, uh, you know, from based on some other sessions where we've talked about testing, you know, we believe this is uh, critical to the success and quality of any API program and, uh, you know, uh, but really just kind of engaging into, you know, what's the mindset I need to think about when I get into this API test world. Uh, this should maybe help with a little bit of the context. And so I'll pass the baton over to Swetha, if you, if you want to mind, Swetha, bring us through. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thanks, Claire, for the introduction. As always, uh, it's it's exciting to be back, uh, you know, to do these sessions with uh, API uh, Day. So uh, thank you once again for this opportunity. As Tony was mentioning, um, we're going to be talking about, you know, setting the context in terms of what we're going to be talking about is, you know, how we can make API testing simple so that it doesn't hinder your adoption of CI, CD, or Agile. Uh, the reason being why this is a huge pain point in terms of, you know, why do I even have to care about API testing? I'm, I'm good with what I'm doing. I can manually test all my code, my app code, right? So why, why do I have to look into um, API testing? The reason why, you know, you need to improve your um, uh, API testing is because the first and the foremost reason is you need to create quality APIs. And why do you need quality APIs? The reason is simple, right? Like I want my customers, I want my consumers to trust me, trust my uh, apps or APIs and increase the confidence in terms of how reliable my APIs can be and how it is important for them in order to, um, you know, um, accelerate their development. So uh, I, I really need to give quality APIs to my consumers and make sure that they're available on time because I'm gonna keep making changes to my API. It's not just a one-time process, right? Like I'm gonna keep adding um, new changes to my code and I have to ensure that the changes that I'm making to my API code um, doesn't actually make my API um, render useless. So what I need to do is I need to have uh, testing happening at almost the same pace as I'm doing my development. And this is of paramount importance to all organizations that are trying to um, digitally transform themselves because you know it's, it's no secret as we all see that every organization, every enterprise is um, trying to adopt or is in the process of adopting APIs and microservices. So that is why we feel uh, automating the testing uh, pipeline to your uh, development pipeline in order to make sure that you know you don't um, you you place equal emphasis on uh, quality and the um, uh, faster delivery of your APIs. And when when we when we talk about delivering APIs along with quality. Um, you know, just a simple ping is not going to suffice, right? Like if I'm just going to check for a 200 status code, that's not comprehensive testing. You need to have a bucket of different tests that's going to help you validate, you know, if your API's behavior is intact. And these could include, um, you know, different tests. Like it could be the functional tests that's going to validate if my API behavior is valid and intact. Or it could be integration test where I'm going to test the end-to-end -end flow when I'm invoke, uh, you know, a series of APIs in terms of, you know, app testing. And it could also include synthetic tests and contract validation to make sure that my API is available, my contract is valid, and whatnot. So you need to have a series of testing done and not just a simple unit testing or a ping that's going to give me a 200 status code. That's definitely not going to suffice, um, you know. Uh, to achieve the objective of creating reliable and high quality APIs. Uh, do you have anything to add, Tony, to this? Uh, uh, thanks, Fatha. You, you know, I think this really does set out, you know, a good agenda, right? Like we we recognize uh, different folks might be at different places where it's the quality of the API program. You know, I'm doing things this particular way. Uh, you know, why should I move over to APIs? You know. Uh, and like the levels of trust in an organization within the boundaries of the org, as well as you know external ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, 
or it may be uh, the, the uh, you know, what we're trying to shift into microservices and APIs. And it, you know, I, I continue to see people just gated by their ability to um, get to agile DevOps processes because they haven't built extensive sets of tests where they can say, you know, I, I could regenerate that today. And, uh, you know, by this afternoon, after, you know, two hours of testing runs, or maybe two minutes of testing mm -hmm. runs, uh, it was in production. Like, uh, everybody would love to get to that kind of golden state uh, of things. Uh, but for some reason, you know, obviously we're challenged uh, as organizations. Uh, it seems like we're challenged to keep internet connectivity too. We lost win. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, challenges organizations to get to that kind of place. And, uh, you know, and, and testing is the enabler, right? A good testing is the key enabler to getting to agile, to getting to repeatability, to getting to increased level of confidence for both the internal. And so, you know, just a tremendous amount of value there, you know, and, and obviously this is a testing session, so we have to say that. But, you know, in fact, it's, it is true. It, it is, is the key inhibitor that I see, you know, and while a lot of people are moving to Kubernetes and microservices, uh, obviously there's, there's other challenges in this domain as well. Uh, but it, it's always comes down to, uh, you know, until I can get there, right? You know, I just, well, so, uh, so I filled in a little bit, so I thought while you were gone, but, um, you know, I, I wonder whether or not others see it the same way <clears throat> where, uh, you know, that's their key inhibitor. Uh, you know, obviously not every organization is there and some people have solved this, uh, but it's uh, still a costly process to solve good testing, you know, like. Um, you know, for many years, if we were, when we were used to do software and waterfall models, just take a lot, a lot of time. Um, and, and, and Claire, I know you, obviously you're out in the community, uh, you know, and maybe you might even suggest, uh, you know, uh, where you see over, uh, you know, uh, looking at this insurmountable mountain of, I, I need a hundred thousand test cases and I don't have them today. And that's my tax before I can get into agile. Yeah, I guess the, the space that I tend to um, uh, find myself talking with uh, with clients and organisations is also is, is the kind of complementary cultures, behaviours, and operating models that you need to be able to to realise um, this type of change. So, as more and more of your um, testing gets automated and more and more is is collapsed into the development cycle, how much how do you start changing things like the relationship between development and support? Because that starts uh, also kind of um, changing the you know, ability, the responsiveness, the, the expectations and so on of teams um, as they uh, you know, rethink things. So uh, I don't know how you, how, how you um, are finding that you're, you're helping clients by accelerating that testing process or actually also um, lifting the um, end user experience when it comes to things like support as well. Um, as you say, yeah. you've got to get yeah. everything right in order to be good. <laughs> got to get testing right. <laughs> got to get a whole lot of other things right as well. Yeah, you know, and, and there's a lot of uh, times where we see it's, you know, uh, it's not that people don't care, right, about testing. Everybody kind of cares to have good quality. But it's, you know, there is a skill set of, you know, what does a good test plan look like and how do I move forward with that? And how do I, what tools do I leverage as I bring it into these things? So to your point of like a lot of consultative process, uh, handshakes between different parts of the organization, you know, whether or not you're doing separate dev and test organizations, now, obviously that's got to be sorted, uh, you know, about whose responsibility, but to your, to your point about the technology uh, as well, you know, there, that, that's where we, we can make tremendous gains and say, you know what, if we can streamline the way that uh, we can have people build uh, successful tests, uh, automation, uh, we basically help commoditize testing across the organization right, a lower skill set and simplify some of the handshaking that would have formerly had to have been between different parts of the organization and say, uh, let's lower the bar to make testing automation of your APIs simpler, right? So basically that, you know, we can get broader adoption uh, within each of, you know, the development communities that are are building effectively uh, or building more effectively at that at that point. And, um, you know, thank you, um, Tony. And actually we've got um, a question from Maruane on the, um, on the chat. Uh, who's asking specifically about how uh, you can validate contracts for the, of the API for consistency through the testing process. Yeah. Sorry, I you want to... Would you one? like to answer that? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So um, when we say contract testing, right, like we're going to check if, if, if that API endpoint is active and, you know, the fields or, you know, the, 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 
spec hasn't changed from what uh, you know I've been using. So using the test cases that I'm generating or let's say I'm creating in this case, I'm going to check for you know if I have you know if my if, if the payload of this API has this data type or if the payload has all these fields that I'm currently using in my software application. So when I have these tests checking for all these different types of data types uh, that's going to be part of the payload, and even if the API endpoint connections are active, I'm going to make sure that you know my contract with, with the API provider stays intact or it hasn't changed. So which means that the API is working as it should be uh, you know, based on the uh, documentation. And if something has changed, the test case that I created or generated in this case is going to fail and let me know that, you know, what was the root cause for this failure based on the test reports that's the, that gets generated when a test case fails. So that would help me determine if, go back and check the spec to see if something has changed, if the provider has made some changes in the API and make sure that, you know, I look at the changes and make changes in my downstream flow. So that's how, you know, you would be able to validate or make sure that you know the contract with your API provider is valid. Uh, do you have anything to add, Tony, to that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking, you know, as we do a lot of this across IBM, as we build software, and you know, of course, a lot of software products have APIs, and and then we have products that work together, and they have these kind of contracts, and so. Not only do we help customers with that as they use our products, but you know internally we do that. You know, and um, what we found is it's incumbent upon the originating organization. You know, I'm building this API to establish you know what, what my contract tests will be, uh, and making sure that I socialize those tests, not just the APIs, but also the tests appropriately with my subscriber community. And so I, I think mechanically, you know, it's with the just as you described, right? But again, uh, as Claire was noting before, there really is, is some process in people, and you know. These are the relationships, and I think uh, you know if if uh, uh, if you uh, try to look at the you know the consistency part it was the, the the germ of the question. Um, uh, being consistent in your your organization as you build an API to make sure that your contract tests are well described, you know, and well known, you know, and you're passing, of course, the muster as you consume it, you know, and obviously that that uh, is going to simplify the downstream model for the subscriber community as well. And so I think there is a mindset change, you know, to uh, the, the, the other one I'll add to that is uh, <clears throat> sometimes we've built APIs for certain other teams. Uh, and what they've done is they've given us tests they would like us to pass, right? And, uh, and that then becomes, you know, we receive those tests and we commit to maintaining the integrity of that test as we go forward in order to ensure that, again, we continue to have that good tight relationship. And so is it tightly coupled? It's not tightly coupled, right? But the contract test helps us to identify, uh, you know, how we continue to move forward together, you know, as we independently evolve, as long as we meet kind of that contract standard, right? And so again, there, there is as much about process here, uh, you know, and, and agreement as there is about uh, the integrity, you know, what is getting tested. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, that um, is, is probably an interesting segue to. There was a question that came in through um, some of the uh, through, through one of the registration questions. So when people um, uh, applied to the conference and selected this workshop, um, they asked about how you started testing an API when you don't have access to documentation or specs of it. Um, I'm sure nothing that would happen in your uh, uh, rigorous engineering practices um, <laughs> at, at IBM, but maybe uh, you know, have, have you seen situation? How do you actually? Um, help manage these sorts of situations. Sorry, Claire, I, I was <clears throat> noticing the, the scroll was going uh, at this different speed than I think. Oh, I I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll type the question in here. Um, it was just at the part of the middle, which I think was the important part for me to remember. Um, <laughs> How do you start? We have to make it. <laughs> oh. Sorry about that. No, no, that's all right. I seem to be typing uh, really slowly, of course, because the pressure's on. There we go. Um, Full of typos. Yeah. How do you start testing an API when you don't have access to documentation uh, or, or specs of the API? 
Uh, well, the, there's two dimensions here, and, and maybe I'll, I'll frame them, uh, you know, and then sweat the past you the baton, maybe if you want to pick one of them to talk about. But you know, I do think that there is, you know, the bottom up and the top down mm -hmm. approaches to how we do development. You know, and obviously, uh, if you don't have the documentation and you don't have the specs, you, you frankly probably don't have the top. <laughs> what you have at the bottom is the integration service, you know, or application service that was developed, you know, as code and not yet managed as an API, you know, and doesn't yet have a formal open API specification. You know, and, uh, you know, frankly, that's uh, going to be the consistency of your application development community, you know, across the, the bottom layer, you know, top versus bottom. Um, top, maybe just to say more specifically, top down being I built the spec first, you know, and then I build the service to the spec, you know, or I built the service first and then built the spec. And depending on which organization you're in, we have a lot of organizations where they've done, you know, things like ESB and they're breaking those up into microservices and deploying those really aggressively and they have the service but they've never had really the formality of an open API spec. There's quite a bit of testing, of course, that you can do with just the service uh, without the open API specification to it. Um, uh, maybe Swetha, I just pass, maybe, maybe you see this one a little bit differently too. You know, I think you're often in the, the other side of the equation, the top down where you, where you do have the spec. Um, some thoughts? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear yeah, you. Uh, that's that's perfectly what I had in mind uh, to me. Like you know, even if we don't have a spec, right? Like uh, we, as a dev or like in in a dev org, basically you can just simply start with a mock endpoint, right? With an endpoint, and then I start building on uh, adding uh, more flesh to the skeleton. So when you actually have an endpoint with, let's say. You, you, you start with an endpoint and then you start developing your spec. You, you can still efficiently start testing at that point of time with just an endpoint where you know you would be able to generate assertions to test, okay, so this is my endpoint. Uh, what's my payload uh, response gonna look like? And once I know that, I'm gonna start generating assertions based on, uh, okay, what should be my response code? Uh, what are the data types of my payload? Uh, what kind of, um, uh, security, um, like authorization or authentication mechanism that I'm going to use for this uh, API. So in short, you don't actually need a spec to start testing. All you need is a skeleton for your endpoint or how your API is going to look like, and you can still start testing. And that's one of um, you know uh, the, the uh, beauties of uh, API testing. You don't need a spec. All you need is an endpoint, and then you can start generating tests or test scripts based on the uh, Skeleton for the input. Yeah, so I, I know we prepped kind of two slides to, to talk yeah. about in this yeah. one, but I, I recognize in this question, you know, in your answer, really, there is a lot of automation that we could provide yeah. in that scenario based on the response. It might be useful to put up, you know, slide number two yeah. and maybe prompting some other questions as well. Sure. Um, but uh, maybe you just kind of tie those two thoughts together a little bit more with respect to some of the text. Uh, the screen just went really weird. Okay, there it is. is it okay. <laughs> Would, um, would you mind just putting it in slideshow mode? Because um, there's some good stuff on the screen there and the, the text is a little bit small. Oh, um, is it good? Perhaps. Can you see my screen? That's better. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, Tony, do you want to start talking or I can uh, set the context then? Uh, well, yeah, just maybe to uh, you know connect the, the dots was uh, you were talking about, you know, even if there's only the endpoint, you, know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a formal spec. Uh, you know, hitting that and getting responses is useful to start that testing discovery process. You know, and again, I, I was thinking that's really actually where a lot of the automation that, you know, we have in our tools actually help, right? right. And so if, you, if you want to just drill down on that one a bit more. Sure, yeah. So when, when it comes to automated testing, right, like the most um, important thing that we at IBM look is to provide flexibility to the developers and the QA uh, teams in order to start testing early in the dev uh, journey, right? Like shifting left actually means, you know, you incorporate testing as you develop the code. And for that, if I'm gonna wait until I have the entire spec ready and then start testing, that's that's not, uh, you know, that's not gonna solve the objective or that's not helping me in uh, making sure that I test as I uh, develop. So that's why we provide the flexibility of, uh, you know, either you can start testing if you have an API spec, great, but what if I don't have an API spec? All I need is an endpoint, right? And with, with that, uh, like Tony explained, I can still look at the payload 
response code and start generating tests to make sure that you know as I develop, am I developing based on uh, you know what I what the skeleton has or what what I intend to develop. In in, in this case, you know how my payload is going to look like. What should be my uh, response code? What are the data types? What are the security API security mechanisms in place? So I can have all of this validated as I move along in the develop uh, the development journey. Like you know move from your dev environment to your QA environment, QA to pre -pro uh, production, pre production to production. So as your code moves along your development pipeline, you would be able to automatically generate test cases. You should be able to automatically generate test cases without having to you know, depend on the availability of the complete documentation or spec. Or even in this case, right? Like, um, I, we need to rapidly make changes to the test cases as I'm making changes to the code. So, uh, your, your testing pipeline or your testing suite should allow you to make those changes immediate. So for that, if I'm going to depend on manually making changes to my uh, test script or test case, that's not going to solve this uh, bottleneck problem that I just explained, right? Like, okay, I make 10 changes to the code, but then uh, testing is going to do a catch-up process. So in, in, in uh, you know, this is possible in either of the cases. If I'm testing with a spec or if I'm just testing with an endpoint, this applies to both these cases. So that's why, you know, in order to um, solve the problem of bottleneck, I update the test scripts or the test cases without having to manually make changes to the code. And that's really important in terms of making sure that, you know, testing doesn't play a catch up to your uh, test process. Thank you. And actually, I think the automation uh, um, theme here is, uh, is, a, is a good one for a, uh, another question that we had that came in um, at registration. I'll just type it in the chat as well in case uh, uh, you need, which was about uh, managing versioning uh, through the testing process. Yeah, you know, for sure, again, you know, let, let, let's assume you're in that organization that uh, has a good set of test cases. Um, you know, the, there's an integrity to the test case that you would assume uh, would be part of a regression cycle, as it were, and uh, is going to be maintained going forward. And so, uh, you know, as Swetha so was describing, I was trying to think about, like, you know, practically, how do I break that down? Like, there is a service out there. I don't really know much about it. It's not documented yet. Uh, I'm supposed to hit that endpoint, uh, but, you know, I don't really know what to expect. So I sent it customer ID one, because I know it does take a customer ID. You know, and it gives me back a payload. And, you know, basically, you know, capturing that and then capturing the safe shape of it and all the dimensionality that Swetha was describing, you know, what response code did it have, what were the fields, what were the data types of those fields, were there children objects, how many child objects came, the, so the header information, like, you know, all of those are a part of the dimensionality of what you can test and should be testing as, as your work. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, again, automating snapshot of all of that information. Uh, but then basically, uh, you know, versioning becomes a very much an exercise in regression validation of the things that you've captured, you know, or test cases you've built, you know, whether they came through an automated means to generate those or not. Um, but, but basically, uh, you know, th there would be an assumption of integrity across cycle and the deltas uh, in what the regress regression testing output uh, 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 shows, illustrates, you know, basically uh, would be either that's part of a version change, right? Uh, and uh, there needs to be an SME who's going to be validating uh, the, the deltas in the version. And so, you know, this is where it gets interesting with respect to how do you manage community? <clears throat> because if I am putting out a V2, you know, there's a, a methodology of do I make both of these available? And so this way I don't force change on everybody. Uh, but, you know, for people at whatever cycle, either through forest or through uh, their ability to, you know, use either one and then specifically switching over to the second one, you know, what kind of information am I available, making available to them with respect to the testing uh, deltas that they should expect, not just the spec changes they would expect, right? And so again, uh, the, the tight correlation between this is my API and the set of contract tests for my API, you can apply that to the versions as well and say, you know, and this is now the new set of contract tests that exist for version two, you know, and you know, by the way, you should also know that, you know, obviously this particular test is going to show differently than it did before. 
And again, I think that's where there's that ownership of, you know, I am contributing this API to the community. Uh, it is in my self-interest to make sure that, uh, you know, there is this inter integrity in the way that I'm putting out my API, you know, and respecting the versions, you know, and how the subscribers mm -hmm. will consume mm -hmm. that with respect to their own testing that they would want to execute as part of contract test. And so, uh, you know, again, um, in there, I think it's, you know, the methodology that you're bringing forward into the version, uh, the assumption of the test cases associated to it, uh, you know, the authority of your contract test that you produce as part of your API, you know, and then the communication model that is going to be in, in, uh, inherently helpful to, you know, any downstream subscribers with respect to their own testing, you know, as you've identified through your publication of the new version. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, that uh, that whole kind of role and responsibilities and how maybe with APIs the traditional role of, of, of test case management or test execution might be perhaps different than other, you know, in inverted commas, traditional software engineering practices is an interesting one. It was actually a question that um, uh, we had came through around, um, you know, who, who should take overall responsibility for API test cases, for example. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, you know, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, and so I want to pass this back to you too also, okay. but the, um, just to start with is, uh, you know, I think the contributor organization of the API must own their test cases, you know, and then work collaboratively with known subscribers around, do I augment my contract test with other things that contribute like we described earlier. But I think there's a, a self-interest in the API product manager, you know, the, the person in, in the full life cycle who is responsible for the business aspects of the program. Uh, you know, and if I am actually building a business with a partner community, uh, of course, I have my development team who are building these, building the test cases, but I'm also uh, independently motivated to make sure that anything that goes out into that community, you know, has good tests, uh, you know, has clear specs, has good guidelines, um, you know, and, and the overall quality of the program, you know, is as much a part of um, the, the business owner's responsibility as it is the IT owner responsibility. You know, and um, this is what, where I was thinking about maybe, uh, you know, obviously uh, test and monitoring, you know, and quality um, are, are really part of both programs, you know, and, uh, you know, while there might be different ways people would say, how do you pull the business in? <clears throat> I think the business independently want their own view of like, well, how do I measure quality at any point, you know, of, of, of the life cycle? And, uh, you know, I know, you, again, you spent some time in that with respect to monitoring and such. And so maybe you can lend a little bit more on that one. Sorry, not sure if your mic is up again. Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Tony, yeah, like, like, like you said, the onus, um, I do feel, falls on the provider side, the business owners, in order to provide valid, useful test cases, share it with, with the consumers or the business partners or the people that are going to use, um, let's say, the APIs, right? Uh, but it also, uh, comes down to uh, you know maintaining good test cases on the business owner's side. Uh, like you mentioned, the product managers, right? So uh, it, it also boils down to having that collaboration between the different teams that's working on the API, be it the development team, the QA team, or even the monitoring team, like, like you mentioned, right? So there has to be a continuous collaboration between these uh, different uh, moving parts within the business owner or the API provider organization in order to make sure that, you know, we provide um, not just high quality APIs, but also uh, quality uh, test cases to our uh, downstream users or consumers. Um, having, having that tight collaboration between these different units would help not only in saving a lot of time, but also reusing, you know, the test cases or the test scripts that the dev team is creating, right? Like as a QA team, I can just take those test cases and reuse them, modify them, add more test assertions to them. Uh, and that's going to make my job as a QA tester a lot easier rather than looking at the code and developing a test script from scratch. So I would also like to mention that, you know, the onus definitely for us, like Tony mentioned, like, you know, uh, the responsibility falls on the business owners, but also uh, having that tight collaboration with within the different units within the business organization, sorry, business organization is um, 
is, is important to make sure that the test cases are uh, of high quality and of great use to your uh, consumers. Yeah. And that probably leads on to you know, the kind of corresponding good question for, you know, as, as more and more organizations uh, and, and certainly a theme for this conference, um, if you follow some of the other tracks, is uh, greater embracing APIs as products themselves. How, how much does the quality of the API uh, actually now inform those the business kind of commercial uh, um, relevant metrics? What, I'd be interested about some of the things that uh, perhaps you and your customers or internal um, uh, teams are, are, are seeing as the metrics that really make a difference in terms of uh, understanding and uh, uh, and measuring the the stickiness of, of APIs and the acceptance and take up that come out of the quality. Yeah, and that's why I thought the monitoring was a great thing to bring in here because you know when we think about the uh, the traditional analytics you as a like an API product owner or product manager would uh, have available to you, you think about uh, you know uh, which APIs are being used, how many times are they called, who's subscribing to them, what value you know can I associate based on the volumes and and, and kind of pervasiveness of those. Um, but I'm also interested, you know, in, in, and of course, those are in the great, wonderful indications of the uh, value of any API that I've produced and shared, you know, and the business that we build around those APIs, whether it's internal or external. <clears throat> but as the, uh, you know, we think about like cloud hosted SaaS solutions, you know, that kind of thinking, uh, you know, when you subscribe up to uh, infrastructure as a service, you're very interested in SLAs, you know, the, uh, you know, is it up? Is it running? Is it, you know, performing appropriately? Am I seeing different latency than I used to see? You know, and so my ability for, you know, the API program to be successful on the business front, of course, also relies on all of those kind of technical in, in implementations as well. And so, uh, you know, so there's, a, again, a broad set of, you know, what do I as the product manager, the business owner, care about? Um, and, you know, it's my responsibility to care about all of that scope. And so, uh, as uh, Swither was describing, things are being, you know, tested and developed in the contract tests. Some subset mm -hmm. of that is going to be really interesting to make sure you bring into your production monitoring environment and say, uh, you know, not only will I, I, I look at just the stats, you know, about who, how many subscribers did we get today? I'm also going to look at the uh, schedule for, you know, I want this particular test running in my production environment every 15 minutes to make sure that, you know, we can immediately take action and reaction, you mm. know, if there is a failure, um, you know, and if, uh, you know, we have a particular uh, check that we do for uh, uh, checking, um, trying to think of a good example, like underwriting, uh, you know, like I may want to make just sure that that is just always running spot on in production, yeah. it's validated on a consistent basis to ensure that, you know, if there is a change, I'm very much as the business owner aware that, you know, we push yep. yeah. it into that community. So there's, a, again, a lot of dimensions by which you might say, what are the things that I want to monitor in the production environment that I care about to ensure, you know, again, there's the integrity there. And, and of yeah. course, the player that brings back, you know, it is quality, right, at the end of the day. Yeah. And some of the learning and all those sorts of things that I go, you know, this, uh, the, the, the signals, you know, continue to, to emerge. Uh, we've got a question from Marielle in the um, chat about uh, any recommendations for uncovering test cases, probably a good one for Sweater. Uncovering any test cases that might not be obvious um, from or that don't one to one map to the API contracts and specs. Um, and you know. Sure. So, when you say uncovered test cases that's not obvious from one to one mapping, um, what, what, what does that exactly mean? Because if I'm looking at my API contract, I know what the API does. Uh, you know, what's the payload going to be look like, uh, you know, looking like and what are the calls that I'm making, like what, what are the different operations I have, uh, what's my payload going to look like. So that gives me a reference point as to, you know, what I should be testing basically if I'm making a call to that API, um, which again, uh, you know, gives me a reference point in terms of what are the test assertions that I would be needing as part of a test case that I would ideally want to use to test this endpoint, right? So I'm... I'm kind of trying to understand the perspective of uh, what L means by uncovering test cases. That's not obvious in terms of one-to-one -one mapping. Tony, do you have some? Um, 
you know, I was trying to ha- wrap my head around the question, you know, and, um, you know, I, I was kind of projecting maybe what I, I could imagine. Like one is, uh, you know, you hear somebody who stepped into a new role mm-hmm. and basically been inherited, you know, this is, here's this test suite. And we're running these 1000 things we have for years, uh, but we really don't know which of them are uh, in, in earnest intent to be uh, authoritative against other ones. Uh, you know, and if they're, I've seen before, like where we say, we have to optimize this, turn the crank on a more regular basis, decrease our test window from eight hours to two hours. Which are the ones that I pull into that two hour version? Right? Because I can't run all of this stuff in the eight hour version. And, you know, and, and getting to that level of specificity on these are the most critical ones. That might be part of that question. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know that there is a mechanical way you could do that. You know, there is an element of, uh, you know, who has value and what, um, you know, and uh, often think about tests you do and you say, uh, you know, last uh, particular organization, part of the organization say, I'm going to be deleting these things uh, next week. Uh, let me know if you care. <laughs> and, and that that brings the people out of the woodworks to like identify which are the most important ones to them. Uh, it, it may be a social experiment that you that you need to to figure some of that out. I think there's a, a, a test coverage aspect to this as well, which is there's a redundancy uh, of things that get covered. You know, we have 10 test cases. Uh, basically, they all do a little bit different thing. But, you know, basically, if I run this particular one, I know I've covered 90 percent of that. Uh, I think those kind of problems you can solve a little bit more mechanically and say, you know, I, I want to just cherry pick across, you know, how do I, I get at least enough coverage in my cherry picking to, you know, cover the majority of test cases. Um, you know, in, in that, uh, depending on what test suite you're using, the ability for them to externalize uh, some of their technology, uh, it, it may be helpful. You know, uh, one of the things that we do with the technology, like, so in our API Connect with our test programs that do a lot of the automation stuff you're seeing here, there's a CLI interface, you know, where you can get a lot of those specs uh, externalized. So if you need to kind of look through everything and figure out how would I go about identifying, uh, you know, ones that, uh, you know, obviously you could go through the user interface, but sometimes you want to run a Perl script against an extract, uh, you know, you could get to that kind of level of detail uh, Mm -hmm. and um, might encourage that as an option. Yeah, I don't know if you're um, following Tony, but Daniel's added, uh, I did ask for a, a bit of a qualifying um, example. Um, he was thinking of something perhaps that sp- spanned many endpoints as a, uh, a place where maybe you need to uncover some uh, you know, test cases that aren't uh, uh, obvious immediately from the from the contract and spec. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's where you, you cherry pick on the URL dimension. You know, I could identify that these 100 test cases are testing that one URL, uh, specifically the slash customer slash, you know, something. Um, and uh, looking for the distinctness uh, that way. Again, depending on what testing tools you're using that generate that, again, I, you need visibility to be able to pull that out and do a distinct uh, operation. Again, I'm thinking regex for something along those lines to just get to uh, the uniqueness set. Um, yeah, just trying to think about, you know, uh, when I do hit contract and get IID often, you know, and I have that in 20 different tests, you know, and you're going to find something like that if you did a scan of a large inventory, which of those 20 do you pick? That's a hard decision, right? I, I would at least want, you know, a positive case and a negative taste case if I can get them. And so, uh, you know, like our, our test cases capture uh, return status code, you know, and maybe that's mm-hmm. another dimension that you could add. Uh, I'll, I'll take at least one for every URL and uh, one for every variation of return code. And after that, I really can't, you know, mechanically tell which of these is better to take. So I'll take the first one, like, you know, and, and unless somebody is coming to the table, you know, and again, I would say, look to your, you know, who owns this API to define better than that. But assuming you don't have that partner, you know, very specifically a partner in the organization, you know, I think uh, you, you're going to have to make a large green decision that way to, to narrow down. And um, do you realize we're actually um, uh, almost about to over on time? <laughs> we've got we've got time for a bit of a sum up. Uh, um, Tony and Sweta, maybe you could just give us a, a, a you know quick couple of headlines um, from uh, uh, you know experiences in your the conversation this afternoon. Um, and then I'm afraid we were going to have to um, uh, have to close out. The time goes so quickly. <clears throat> so I think to start us up. Sure. Or- so. Um- I think we had like great conversations happening here today. A lot of 
good questions and um, you know something to think about uh, in terms of you know what we're going to plan for for our future. So that's so that aspect of the kind of conference has been really great. Um, as I said, uh, automated testing or API testing uh, is definitely going to be something that every organization needs to look into as they are, you know, in the process of uh, digitally transforming themselves. Um, and making sure that, you know, you have API testing integrated as part of your DevOps pipeline is of, uh, you know, it's, it's going to pay in great dividends. It, it might look like, you know, it's, it's complex. It's, you know, how am I going to do it? It sounds so difficult, but um, we've got like, great technologies at IBM that's, that would definitely help you solve, you know, this, um, this, this huge pain point, which, you know, kind of box you down when you even think about it, right? Um, so if, if any of you are interested, we are going to have a live meetup session that's going to happen uh, next Thursday. I'll, I'll share the URL. Uh, it's a free virtual uh, meetup that we are organizing where we are going to talk about this specific IBM technology where and show you a live demo on how uh, you know this is going to solve the problem of automating your API testing. So if you're interested, please do come join us and take a look at what our uh, technology can actually do. Uh, Tony, um, if you can um, type the uh, details in the uh, chat. Sure. I'll so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was uh, thinking about links when you said that, and I was reminded uh, that we have your um, white paper also on API oh, testing. Yeah. Put a link out there in the chat on that one. Cover a little this topic of you know how, how, what, what's available now, and I mean it's a, a key blocker we see that's impeding a lot of progress. I know. Years have just been saying, you know, we, we continue to want to get to continuous uh, development, but we just can't get to the level of automation of uh, the test frameworks that we need, you know, and, and frankly, using technologies to help build that test uh, suite out again is a, is a great accelerator. We think that's a key way to, to go forward, you know, and then if we get even better business results, because, you know, that with more transparency and more consistency and uh, the, the integrity of the program that you want. So, uh, you know, again, it's passionate about the topic because I think it's helpful to a lot of customers that we've seen. And so, uh, you know, definitely make uh, sure you take advantage of some of those assets. Uh, the, the white paper is great, again, to just reinforce some of the learning about automation. Uh, and I appreciate some of the other questions about just the process, Does it, the, the methodology that you go about, um, you know, building into your organization a good discipline around tests, really, you know, uh, that's how you make sure you ensure this, the success of the future of the program, you know, and you don't have those kind of large grain failings, uh, you know, where there's these interdependent dependencies and everybody goes down. Um, you know, it really does rely on a good foundation like this. Fantastic. Thank you both um, so much. It's been an, and to IBM for making uh, uh, this type of um, conference at all um, happen. Uh, it, we had some really great feedback from people in the, uh, the online chat. They found it a really enlightening session. So, uh, um, thank you both for your time. Uh, hopefully you can, you know, have a great rest of the day. Uh, maybe get back a little bit more sleep. <laughs> uh, given it's been an early start and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Claire. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, thank you all. Bye.